start here. I'm a little discombobulated. All right, so um, thank you for making the time to hear from the FFL today. Uh, I'm thrilled to be here. I had the pleasure of presenting a three-hour pre-conference on Monday and so wish we had the time to do the same today, but unfortunately we don't. So I'd like to spend about 30 minutes sharing with you and then have about 15 minutes at the end for a Q&A. Uh, that's not a lot of time, so I'll have to use my notes to stay on track and on time. We'll answer Q&A at the end, so jot down your questions as we go along. And let's get started, okay? How many from public libraries? Wow, fabulous. How many academics? Okay, and schools? Awesome. And specials? All right. And of all of you, how many of you are currently making in your libraries? Okay. How many of you are planning on making in your libraries? And how many of you are still on the fence? <laughs> all right, we're all in. Great. Okay. So let's get started. <laughs> so the FFL was an early adopter of making in libraries. In fact, we were the first to create access to the tools of making, including 3D printing in a public library. Today, we have three <coughs> distinct maker spaces in operation. The FFL Fab Lab, our digital creation lab, and our little maker space. We at the FFL are in absolute agreement with Neil Gershenfeld of MIT, who says, and I loosely quote above, I loosely quote above, the power of fabrication is social, not technical. We agree that the power and purpose of making in libraries is not in the equipment or the technology, but it's in making's ability to bring people together. Ultimately, the FFL creates access on our library platform to tools, equipment, technology, content, software, but most importantly, to each other. This access paves the way for community members to share and create new knowledge, <laughs> to learn and develop 21st century literacy skills, to experience discovery, invention, and entrepreneurship, and ultimately to connect. This community engagement through making is essentially community building. The library creates access to the transformative experiences. The community members, however, transform their own lives. The idea to bring transformative technologies and maker culture into our library began around 2010. We had a very strong, inherent understanding of our community and knew that they would embrace access to transformative technologies, such as 3D printers, that they didn't have access to anywhere else. Before investing time and resources, we began by testing the idea and community support for it by hosting maker open houses once a month on Saturdays. During these maker open houses, we would roll out one donated 3D printer into our community room meeting space, along with other hands-on activities like take apart electronics, duct tape art, and more. To our delight, hundreds of people came from the local community and from miles around. This huge response, combined with interactions with community members, confirmed that we were moving in the right direction. Through our conversations with community members, we had that eureka moment. We started taking business cards of people who were saying things like, I'm so excited by what's going on here, I want to be a part of it, I want to help with it, I'd love to teach class, I don't know how to be involved, but I'd like to be, and more. So we developed a deeper understanding that there are so many talented, passionate people in our community right now who want to connect with others around their areas of passion and interest and who want to share their skills, not just around making, but around all types of topics. Recognizing this potential and willingness within our community, we began to make a targeted effort to invite community members to share what they're passionate about and what they know, to get involved and engaged in deeply meaningful ways. Adapting the work of John McKnight and Peter Block from their profound little book, The Abundant Community, we developed a new community engagement tool that we now feature in our public spaces and use to capture informal conversations. And you see it on the screen, and I also had some handouts. If you didn't get it, email me. I'll pass it along to you. This form serves as our volunteer application. When we're talking with someone who says, I'm interested in what's going on here. For example, I'd love to get involved. I'm a robotics enthusiast. We use this tool to capture their enthusiasm and to then provide them the platform to get involved. 
Instead of our old volunteer model where we slotted people into roles we identified a need for, we now invite the community to come to us with their ideas, interests, and passions. We open up the library as a platform on which they can share their ideas and create and share new knowledge and make meaningful connections with each other. As you can see, this is not a typical volunteer application or survey. Our tool asks the relevant, meaningful questions. One, what do you love to do? Two, what are you passionate about? And three, would you be willing to share what you know with your neighbors? This tool is used daily at the FFL and in the FFL community and has played into a new booming volunteer base as well as informing us and evolving our understanding of the kinds of things our community members are interested in. So as a result of this philosophy and approach, <laughs> we've been able to broaden and deepen our library programming and services. We've been able to offer more classes, clubs, and programs on a much wider variety of topics at a fraction of the cost. We've been able to take funds we used to spend on lecturers and performers and reallocate existing dollars to technologies and digital resources that support our community members' interests and needs today. In fact, we've been able to reduce, through reallocation, our general program budget by more than 43% over two years. Furthermore, our community is getting stronger with individuals building relationships and skills that they would not have been able to otherwise if not for the library. As you can see on the screen, many of these skills that community members are sharing with one another include skills that can lead to workforce success, such as traditional literacy skills, STEM literacy skills, digital literacies, and more. On the screen is a very short list of some of the programs that are led by our volunteers, our community participants. So more than 40% of our classes, clubs, and programs are today led by community volunteers. To date, hundreds of classes, clubs, and one-on-one -on -one appointments and programs have been led by community participants. This translates to a community-centered platform for making openly accessible to an engaged community where over 4,000 community members to date have met, made connections, and have learned skills from one another. None of this engagement, knowledge exchange, and creation and connecting would have been possible if not for the library. I'm gonna share a few very short case studies in which we've implemented our evolving philosophy of community engagement and outcomes-based planning and assessment to bring new meaningful impacts to our community. And the first is sewing. We started with the notion that many members of our community would be interested in learning how to sew at the library. We knew that there really wasn't anywhere in the community where people could go for access to sewing machines if they didn't own one or had access to the expertise they'd need to learn to sew without paying for expensive classes. We decided to buy a couple of inexpensive machines and we put a notice about it in our bathroom stalls. We have a PR tool idea borrowed from a college hockey arena in Oswego, New York, that we call In the Stalls, where we highlight new happenings at the library. It goes without saying that almost everybody at some point sees In the Stalls. In it, we wrote, we're planning to start a sewing program at the library. Let us know if you're interested in getting involved. You wouldn't believe the huge outpouring of support we got just from that small piece of publicity. Right away, we had all types of people stepping forward saying they wanted to become involved. These interested community members began leading classes, donating and sorting fabric, even organizing all-day sewathons where donated fabric was used to make items needed by local and global charitable organizations. On the screen are examples of the qualitative impact of sewing. These are excerpts taken from letters written and testimonials given by some of our sewing community participants, and I'll read just a couple. This is my favorite. Since early retirement, I've been sewing again, mostly alone. Imagine my excitement about a group setting. The FFL describes itself as a place where people can come together to find resources for the learning that they themselves desire. I've seen it happening in the fab lab, the connecting, the sharing, and the learning. So some of our more quantitative impacts with sewing to date, uh, dozens of sewing lessons and quilting, quilting club meetings and several all-day sewathons, 
Uh, we've made hundreds of items for local, cha local charitable institutions from the donated fabric. And we've had, to date, over 800 attendees at sewing classes, clubs, and events. Some examples of items made for local charities include waterproof sleeping bags that fold into backpacks for the homeless. Dozens of these were made and distributed during the freezing Syracuse winter months. Several sewathons also focused on helping the home for new young mothers in need. At one weekend sewathon event alone, the following items were made and donated. 40 nighties, 40 swaddlers, 40 blankets, 10 burp pads, diaper totes, cat, coat and hat with mitten sets, and 17 hooded bath towels with matching washcloths. So, our next case studies are Lego robotics programs. <clears throat> Who in here has the conference plague? I'm so dry and my nose is running. Anybody else? <laughs> so it's not just me. Bear with me. So our, our Lego robotics programs. Community members brought us this inspiration. We had local grandparents and parents approach us and express that there was nowhere for local kids to become part of a First Lego League in our community. In case you don't know, First Lego League is an international competitive Lego robotics league for students ages 9 through 14. In First Lego League, children be, uh, program an autonomous robot using the Lego Mindstorms robot set in order to bless you, in order to score points on a thematic playing surface as you see in the images on the screen. They also create innovative solutions to a societal problem, all while being guided by the First Lego League core values of teamwork, gracious professionalism, and cooperation, which just so happen to be an important 21st century skill for succeeding in the workforce. Teams also fundraise, create a team identity, and talk to experts in the field. When we had a few adults come forward and express interest in the library as a host for our first Lego League team, we began by holding an interest meeting. We commuted with over 30 families turning out for the first meeting. As a result, we've now hosted four seasons of first Lego League with 10 students each time, which is the match more than the maximum allowed. We've also started our own standalone Lego Robotics Challenge programs for kids who can't be on the team. We call these Lego Brainstorms for grades three through five, Lego Mindstorms for grades six through nine, and most recently, we've added a competitive first tech challenge team for grades nine through 12. On the screen is a testimonial from our FFL coaches who are also FFL librarians, Margaret and Pete. And I'll just read those to you. Uh, coaches witness students who didn't know each other before, working together, building friendships and confidence, and developing innovative solutions to problems, both technical and societal. They're learning to not be afraid to fail, the mindset of an innovator. And at this point, uh, hundreds of students have deepened their development of 21st century literacy skills, including teamwork skills, creative problem solving, coding skills, and engineering skills through these Lego robotics offerings. As you may be aware, computer science and coding are fast becoming top funding priorities for IMLS, the National Science Foundation, and the White House. In fact, last month in February 2016, President Obama announced his Computer Science for All initiative. Where's Brandy? Brandy, are you in the room? Brandy from New York Public is doing a session this afternoon on coding. Are, are you with her? <laughs> Go to that program. This is important stuff. The, okay, so the question is where in communities will this critical learning occur? The answer, us, libraries. Libraries are uniquely positioned to provide fun and meaningful programs and learning opportunities to support this national priority. We are already here in every community. The answer lies with us. Our third case study is our FFL Geek Girl Camp, which was a week-long camp for 44 girls in grades 3 to 5, which we piloted in the summer of 2013. This was one of the first programs where we used our developing FFL assessment tool, which we'll discuss later, which many of you uh, picked up uh, from the handouts. If you didn't get one, email me. And we'll discuss it a little bit later. Uh, this tool measures impacts and outcomes. We started with the main objective of, prov of providing an immersive, informal STEM learning opportunity for girls in grades three through five in particular, 
with the result of the formation of a community of girls and women who are interested in STEM topics. While there are expensive paid camp opportunities for middle schoolers and teens locally, no STEM day camps existed for girls in grades three through five which research shows us is the time when children are forming their initial powerful impressions of career fields and making lasting judgments about which fields are for them and which are not. We did this research and came to understand that there is generally a lack of clear early pathways for girls in STEM fields and also, and more importantly, a lack of access to female role models in STEM fields. Our camp sought to meet these <coughs> needs locally and provide a model for other libraries seeking to meet the same needs in their communities. We instilled a playful sense of fun and camaraderie into this hands-on learning camp. We did activities like launching rockets, dancing on a pool of bootleg, making our own marble runs, and much more. We had different women guest speakers each day, including PhD students in the sciences and professionals who work for giants like Google, Facebook, pharmaceutical companies, and the U.S. Air Force. These women all have diverse STEM careers ranging from forensic science to studying mangroves in Senegal. <coughs> to measure impact, we collected feedback from campers and their parents before, during, and after the camp. At the beginning of the week, we asked each girl what they wanted to be when she grows up. Many responded they wanted to be teachers, actresses, and singers. By the end of the five-day week, we asked the same question again and got answers that included computer scientist, pilot, physicist, and more. Their answers proved that we accomplished our goal of introducing these girls to STEM in an effective way, boosting their confidence and level of interest, hopefully, for the rest of their lives. We also ran a subsequent Meet Girl Day over February break and noted that 75% of the participants returned from the previous summer. The Summer Learning 2016 season will be our third Beat Girl camp. All of our CITs or counselors in training are graduates from a previous camp. This summer, due to multiple requests from area parents, we will also host a Geek Guy camp for boys in grades five through eight. We piloted a one-day camp for boys this February, last month, and it was a great learning experience for all of us. We learned a lot about the different learning styles of boys and girls from the February break, one day events, and plan to incorporate what we've learned by customizing the summer week-long camps for boys to better fit their learning needs. The FFL Fab Lab is our final case study. In early 2015, we developed a plan to capture more of the outcomes of the tremendous impactful day-to-day -day activity happening in our FFL Fab Lab. This space includes nine 3D printers, a laser cutter, <coughs> vinyl cutter, sewing machines, craft tools, hand tools, and much more. It's a drop-in space where patrons have free and open access to the tools of making. All they need to do is to attend the certification to be able to use each piece of equipment safely and independently. This winter, we've launched online 3D certifications, so a person can be certified from anywhere, from anywhere and from the comfort of their couch. Compared to capturing the impact of an individual program or series, clearly it's more complex to assess an entire service or space. We used our FFL assessment tool to put together a plan for the type of data we wanted to capture related to our makerspace. And once again, some of you have that, and uh, some of you don't. Email me if you don't, and you're interested. Like the services mentioned before, measuring the impact of the FFL Fab Lab is about both numbers and stories. As far as the numbers go, since 2013, our staff and community participants have led over 4,000 equipment certifications. Many of these include certifications for young people in our area whose access to these unique training opportunities is setting the stage for them to develop interests in sk and skills in fields such as technology, manufacturing, design, engineering, and, help them, and helping them to learn the mindset of an entrepreneur and innovator and disruptor. Staff and community members have also led over 200 3D modeling classes, meaning that over 200 community members have learned valuable skills that may parlay into career or business development. 
So this all takes on additional meaning when you realize the types of things that are being made once people are trained in the Fab Lab. Invention, entrepreneurship, discovery, and real world problem solving and solutions happen and are developed each day in the FFL Fab Lab. In one example, Syracuse University held a two day long conference focusing on student created tech startups. The conference was open to the public to gather interest and even investment opportunities. The FFL was invited to have a table at this conference. While there, we stumbled upon an FFL patron who also was a student at SU. He had designed an iPad app driven by a toothbrush, fitted with a gyroscope, Bluetooth transmis transmitter, and a motor. Altogether, this new product would allow kids to play a game on their iPad while ensuring they didn't miss a spot brushing their teeth. <laughs> what was so amazing about this product to us was that the inventor had made all of his product designs and even the toothbrush holder itself using the Fab Lab equipment. In another example, Jeremy Ming Tao Wu developed Bike Rules while visiting our Fab Lab. Bike Rules was a 3D printed turn signal that attached to the handlebars on a bike. Jeremy has since made his invention smarter by adding GPS functionality. Now the GPS can log and track your trip using Bluetooth. Kane is the young man you see above. Kane is a regular user of the FFL Fab Lab and spends a lot of time meeting challenges on the popular website DIY.org. Kane was earning a lot of badges through his competitions and wanted a way to display them, but couldn't find anything that already made that fit his needs. So, true to his DIY and innovative nature, Kane developed a design and utilized the laser cutter in the FFL Fab Lab to execute his design. We learned more from Kane through this experience than he did from us, particularly in relation to the functioning of this equipment. Kane's badge holder became a top trending item on DIY.org. You can purchase his design there. And it also resulted in an interview with Kane and DIY reps on NPR. So it was great press for the FFL and a wonderful experience for Kane, as you can imagine. In our opinion, these are all excellent examples of how having access to making in the center of the community contributes to discovery, invention, entrepreneurship, and the development of all 21st century literacy skills. So this is what uh, Paul and I were kind of wrestling with. I had a screen that disappeared, and it had two short videos on it that I really wish I could play for you to talk about, <laughs> to, to show you examples of some great entrepreneurship, but I'm just gonna tell you about them. The first one is Mark Andrews, and he's a consultant, and he works for Apple, and he's one of our patrons at the FFL, and he developed a product called the Speaker Slide, and you can Google that and look it up. Uh, he uh, not only did he develop the product, this adaptable product, but he also used our creation lab to develop his campaign for Kickstarter to get funding uh, for, for this um, item. And he's had great success with that. The second is Peter Daly. He's a dad and an inventor who used the Fab Lab to prototype an adaptive motion switch that could be hooked up to his child's toy so that his daughter and all children with special needs could then interact with a toy. So basically what it is, I can, there's even a picture of it here because we lost the slide, but there's, um, you develop this switch and the switch attaches to the toy and also attaches to a sock that goes on his daughter's foot. And uh, when she moves her left foot, she's able to change the music on her toy. So uh, incredible real world problem solving that happened in the FFL Fab Lab. And he and his occupational therapist have brought that idea and that product uh, to, uh, to market, to be able to sell that, so that other uh, children can benefit from that. So once again, these examples show how libraries cannot, uh, uh, can be not only a resource for passive information consumption, but can serve as a catalyst for economic development, invention, and entrepreneurship. So in addition to individual entrepreneurs, the Fab Lab also supports the efforts of local small businesses. Many companies in the area have found that we can be a valuable resource and they in turn often end up sharing their expertise with us and most importantly with our patrons and community. 
For instance, Hotwick is a local small business that produces tabletop lighting for restaurants. They've used our Fab Lab to prototype new product designs. On the other end of the lighting spectrum, Ephesus is a local startup that produces LED stadium lighting. They've used our Fab Lab to print out small scale models of their lighting in order to, in order to assist them in explanations and sales pitches to new clients. Through a connection from our robotics club, a small local biomedical company called ICOR found that our Fab Lab could assist them in prototyping parts for their research in age-related macular degeneration. Many of these relationships with small businesses are not only good for our local economy and community, but benefit the library and the business involved directly. For instance, McKintock is a company which creates systems that make dumb machines, such as old factory mills and other old equipment, smart by adapting them with sensors. This allows companies to track usage as well as alerting personnel to required maintenance on equipment. McKintock has been working with us to build and test their new MT Connect product that would make dumb machines smarter, doing initial testing on some of the equipment in our lab, like our laser cutter and 3D printers. In the future, the tools they're working on could assist all of us with our regular maintenance of machines of all types throughout the library. To stimulate these unique relationships, we host innovation tours on a regular basis, where groups come into our spaces and learn about what's possible. These groups may be other libraries interested in bringing making to their libraries, but just as often, tours are requested by schools, educators, museums, and all types of businesses. For instance, Upstate Medical, a local teaching hospital, came and toured our space to determine what these new technologies could mean for them, and ended up scanning and printing brain stems and, and anatomical models for use with their neuroscience students. The NIH approached us, approached us about featuring their new 3D print exchange tool in our space. This tool is essentially a repository for creating, sharing, and downloading 3D printable models. High Tech Rochester is a local company who tur toured the Fab Lab to learn from us in efforts to develop a makerspace specifically geared as an incubator for startups in the nearby city of Rochester, New York. Local area schools and high schools have toured our space and then developed makerspaces of their own. Utica Polytech asked us to come and consult as they imagined a makerspace in their campus library. And countless libraries from across the area and around the world at this point have done the same. So what can collaborations and partnerships look like for you and your community? Remember, just like your maker programs, your partnerships will be unique to your community's talents and strengths. I have a note here to remind uh, you all, or to talk with you all about this. Um, I visited communities really all over the world, virtually and physically at this point around making. And uh, this is the theme. Make, for making to be successful in your community, making has to start with your community. You have to have a really deep understanding about what's important to your community, what their aspirations are, what their talents are, what their strengths are, what their problems are. And your making platform has to reflect that. I uh, visited a community in Western Canada that was all about jewelry making and crafting. So that's what their major space is about. Uh, I visited with some folks in Australia and their community was really interested in having a space where they could come together and rebuild cars. So they bought an old garage and old cars were donated there and the community would come together and rebuild old cars. And in a library like environment in Nigeria, soap making became their making focus. So once again, what are your community's aspirations, talents, interests, and strengths? That's where you need to start. It's not about the tools. It is not about a 3D printer. It is not about a 3D printer. It's not about a laser cutter. It's not about the tools. It's about what your community is interested in, is passionate about, and what problems they're seeking to solve. So I'd like to provide just a few more examples of mutually beneficial partnerships and collaborations, and hopefully these examples will get your wheels spinning about all the possibilities as you seek to create or expand upon your maker initiatives. So back in 2010, when we began to understand that making was the direction our community wanted us to go, 
we approached a local company called Express Computer Services for a donation of our first 3D printer. The printer was one that had to be assembled. Imagine that, <laughs> right? That's one. Yikes. So how do you put one together when very few people even know what a 3D printer is? We looked to our community. Syracuse University students and faculty helped us put this machine together. Indeed, our relationship with our local colleges and universities has proven to be invaluable for numerous reasons. Students have ideas, cutting edge knowledge, enthusiasm, and time. Don't they, Annie? We do. They're looking to gain experience. Many programs of study require volunteer hours or internships. We can serve, our libraries can serve as a place where they can take their ideas and enthusiasm and parlay them into something concrete for our communities. We can offer them the real world experience they're looking for while they can bring fresh vision and knowledge to projects and move our programs and community forward. Once 3D printing was available and popular at the FFL, supporting 3D computer aided design was the next logical direction we wanted to move in. In our community, we discovered that there was a significant group of CAD users, including students, engineers, manufacturers, and hobbyists. Through informal and formal conversations, we found that multiple local manufacturing businesses purchased CAD software through the same re retailer. We approached this company and they donated us a lab license to SolidWorks, a professional 3D modeling software used by many engineers. For the past several years, not only has this retailer offered group classes on the software at the library, we've also had community volunteers training other patrons on the software. Our volunteers include everyone from young mechanical engineers look, looking to boost their resumes to retired engineers looking to keep their skills fresh and contribute to the community. Thanks to this partnership, young kids to seniors are learning how to create their own 3D models using CAD at the library. In another example, we were approached by a company called Webucator. Who knows about Webucator? You need to know about Webucator. This is a national online technology learning company based in Syracuse. Members of their staff were familiar with the offerings our library had and they came to us and offered our patrons free access to their self-guided courses on technology topics such as Adobe software, for instance. We had already identified this kind of self-guided tech learning as a developing need of our patrons, so it was timely and we were more than eager to partner with them. We've set, since helped Webucator advance the initiative called the Library Partner Program, which allows any library, any library, to distribute voucher codes so that patrons can have free access to their online courses. This is a win-win for libraries like ours, all of ours, and Webucator, since libraries get to offer this great free content to their patrons and Webucator gets to expand their reach and get their name out there, hopefully gaining the attention of corporate clients looking to purchase in-person training. Obviously, partnering with local business and organizations as well as national industry vendors has been critical for gaining not only the things we've needed, but also tapping into local expertise and new audiences we were looking to reach. Through partnerships, we've been able to help uh, to pilot new learning tools, services, and products and provide direct feedback to vendors and businesses in order to help them remain relevant. Our partnership with Grodar is another great example of this. Through meetings, discussions, and tours of our spaces, who's familiar with Grodar? Okay. We've helped Grodar get in touch with the goals and needs of a 21st century library. We hope our relationship can help a company like Grodar stay viable and relevant, but most importantly, so that we can turn to them as a trusted industry vendor for our developing needs rather than trying to seek out solutions from Amazon or going on wild goose chases to find items to solve our problems, oftentimes these items just don't exist. Finally, if there are not-for-profit makerspaces, tech incubators, tech meetup groups in your area, these are also great organizations to reach out to and develop mutually benefit beneficial relationships with. Maybe a maker meetup group exists in your community and you can provide them a new venue where they can meet plus promotion. Maybe a tech incubator has a listserv to post your volunteer opportunities on. 
Maybe you want to partner with a for-profit makerspace so you can provide referrals to each other's complementary classes, programs, and services. After all, library makerspaces are an entry point into making. We're about discovery and skills building. For-profit makerspaces are about production. Maybe a local high school has regular internships uh, projects that they're looking for host sites for. Maybe a local tech school has interns who would benefit from experiential learning at your site. Any and all of these examples of simple ways to develop mutually beneficial relationships can help move your maker initiatives forward. So to conclude, I'd like to wrap up by showing two examples of tools we use at the FFL to measure impacts and value, such as the ones I've mentioned in the case studies. Just as making has served as a catalyst for rethinking our approach to volunteerism and community engagement, making has also served as a catalyst for rethinking our approach to program and service development and assessment. When we started with making, we very quickly began to see new types of impacts that we didn't anticipate. We saw people using the library in new and groundbreaking ways. We saw that our programs, services, and spaces were now strengthening local small businesses, facilitating the development of inventions and innovations, causing local young people to get excited about STEM topics and deepen their STEM skills, and so much more. We began thinking more critically about how to best capture all of these meaningful impacts and outcomes. In doing so, we developed an FFL assessment tool, which we now use with all of our programs and services. Through this outcomes-based planning and continuous assessment, we don't develop or launch new things because they're trendy, cool, or we just think we should. The assessment and proposal uh, templates allow us to think strategically, both as individuals with new ideas and collectively as a team before we allocate our limited resources in any direction. What outcome impact do we want to achieve? What actions do we need to take to get there? What evidence will we collect along the way? What changes are necessary as a result of our actions? What's working? What's not? Most important question, what's not? Finally, how will we communicate results with all of our stakeholders effectively? We built the pieces of our assessment tool into our program and service proposal uh, template. So with our proposal template, every new idea at the library, every new idea, begins by identifying intended impacts and outcomes first. The proposal template it process is required for every new idea, every new idea. It's a valuable exercise for each individual on the team who has an idea to run it through this process before bringing it to me and ultimately to one of our five monthly forums for further development. It helps to focus individual thinking. What do I want to accomplish with this program or service? What are my hoped for outcomes? How much will it cost? What kind of staff training will be necessary? What other resources will need to be utilized? What has to change to make this possible? My role in this process as the FFL administrator is facilitator. Each time a proposal is completed, I review it to test it against our mission, which is to provide free and open access to ideas and information, our current budget priorities, and our current organizational focuses and priorities. Once, it's, one, once it is determined through this discussion that the idea should move forward, I assign it to one of our five monthly staff forums. The five include um, Access Innovation, which is all about collections, reference, user experience, and access. The second is a STEAM forum, all about STEAM. The third is a Making forum, all about making. Making and STEAM obviously go together. <laughs> summer Learning, which is all about the all-important summer reading season. And All Staff, which is all programs and services, including special one-off events and fundraising that don't fit into any of the other forums. We make it an organizational priority to schedule this time every month to think together. And I know many of you are sitting out there thinking there is no time, how do you do that, it would never work at my place. Yes, it would. If it becomes an organizational priority to schedule time 
for everyone across the organization to move in the same direction and to be planning all new services and activities together down the road you're not going to waste time with the dreaded buy-in process and you're not going to waste time trying to get them on board if you're proactive about it and make it an organizational priority to schedule time it's your most important relationship that internal one everybody's asking us to transform all over the place and do all these amazing things and be innovative if our internal relationships are not strong and healthy and based on trust and full communication we can't do any of those things so take care of your own house first that's just my little two cents <laughs> So once again, no longer are we saying at the FFL, let's try this because it sounds cool, relevant, interesting. Instead, now we're able to say very confidently, let's try this in order to achieve X result. And in order to prove that we achieved X as a result, we're going to collect X pieces of information along the way. So hopefully many of you got copies of these um, tools and templates, et cetera. If you didn't, let me know. Phew, okay, we did it. So uh, it was a pleasure having the opportunity to share with all of you today. Hi, Stephen. Uh, um, really fast share with all of you today. We have about 15 minutes left for questions. Yes? You're up at 10.45. 10 we have two minutes left. <laughs> <laughs> that was so fast. <laughs> yes, uh, what kind of staff training did you have to do the staff how to use the laser cutter, the minor cutter, etc. We've got some staff who are learning how to use email. Right. <laughs> that's that's wow. where we are. I totally understand and I, I feel that. Okay. <laughs> the professional staff is required to attend all five of the monthly forums that I talked with you about. They're one hour forums, they're agenda driven, we don't go off agenda, each agenda item has a certain amount of time. The professional staff does peer-to-peer -peer training and learning in these forms. So if we introduce a new piece of equipment, for instance, a new laser cutter, in the Maker Forum, the staff teach each other through uh, learning together how to use this piece of equipment. Oftentimes, we'll have a vendor representative come and help us with that learning, and more than likely, you know, they're willing to do that. And uh, if we shout them out, most importantly, through our promotional avenues, they, they really appreciate that. So that learning happens there. And then for our support staff, which um, at the FFL, all of our frontline staff are Syracuse University students. Annie's one of them. And um, these students have uh, meetings um, quarterly. And what we try to do is incorporate that same learning, that same general learning, into those sessions. And also with support staff members, um, continuously over 30, 60, 90 days, and now it's kind of expanded beyond that, there's regular training on different pieces and parts of all library services and, and needs to make sure that everybody, our goal is that everybody is working with the same level of general information. We never want our community members to come into the library and have that experience where, oh, person X is not here today, so I can't get my need met. They should be able to come to any of us and get that need met on demand. So that's our goal with the forums. Can you talk more about the certification for the features? Yes, you can go on our website, uh, www.fflib.org backslash make. And there you will find forms and tools and uh, everything that you could possibly need um, to uh, get people certified and as I mentioned there's also an online component of that now that we've just launched in February so basically what the certification does is really quick really easy and anything that's sharp pointy hot you know potentially dangerous and dangerous we make sure that everyone is certified on that equipment before they are able to, to use it independently and once they are certified we put that certification on their patron account so that once they've learned that's our goal that this space is, is a, uh, 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 the, the goal is for patrons to be empowered, to be able to come in and use the C equip equipment anytime that we're open with very little facilitation or direction from library staff or, or volunteers. 
So uh, the certifications is one means to that end. Now, I know Sue would love to be stalked all over the conference <laughs> and come up to the front. If you wonder how she has time to do all this, it's uh, she saves 20 minutes every morning on doing her hair. <laughs> but, you know, there's another strategy. But please join me in thanking Sue for sharing her knowledge.